So I, I want to start by just saying thank you to y'all for, for having me here. It, I, I just really in the last, I guess it's been 12 hours since I got here. Um, it's, it's been an inspiring experience. And, and I was telling a group of students this morning, and I've now repeated it to two other classrooms, that um, yesterday morning I was at a meeting in Atlanta with a group of uh, representatives, leaders of the interfaith community. There were rabbis and priests, re reverends, uh, imams, and we asked them to meet with us uh, because we, we are trying to build partnerships in Atlanta with the interfaith community. We're, we're trying to help them understand the way that the criminal justice system impacts members of their congregations, um, young people in their communities, and we're trying to partner with them to help think about how we can support the lawyers who ultimately are responsible for representing so many of the people uh, in their congregations. And this, the, the, the meeting was held at the Hope Center. And the Hope Center is a uh, it, it's a beautiful meeting place that was built right across the street from the uh, Martin Luther King Center. And I walked into the Hope Center, I'd never been there before, and, and there are articles framed on the wall, and there was one particular article uh, that, that quoted uh, uh, Reverend Joseph Lowry. And Reverend Lowry said, you cannot build a movement without young people. And that really moved me because I spend my career, my two careers, right? I'm either teaching at Atlanta's John Marshall or running Gideon's Promise, but I spend my careers working with young people. And, and really that quote sums up why. I, I work with young people because I do believe that we need a better world. I believe we need to improve society. And I believe that it's young people that will, that will ultimately do it. Um, and so I was inspired, really, as I, as I spent the last 12 hours with your students, because um, some of them are going to be part of a, a movement to, to build a better world. I, I think one of the questions that I was asked, really, in each of the three uh, presentations or meetings that I had, was what sorts of things might we do as law school professionals to um, better train our graduates. And I think about that a lot because I remember my law school experience. And my law school experience actually is quite different than, than already what I see the Toro Law School experience is. I went to a law school where none of my professors ever practiced uh, law. Um, but, but, but even more so, really never thought much about what it means to practice law. Uh, they didn't have, we didn't have, at least I wasn't uh, introduced to the adjunct faculty that, that already I've met here at Toro. And, and the, the commitment to public interest that you have at Toro really does seem to be strong. And so um, as I reflected back on my law school experience, what I really remembered was, uh, was a process. It was a process to help me learn what I needed to learn to pass the bar. Um, and my inspiration to do the work I did came from experiences I made for myself. I, I, I spent some time in a public defender's office and got inspired through that. Um, but what I think we can do as legal professionals, and what I think you all are doing here, is it's more than just teaching skills. It's more than just teaching knowledge. I think much of what we need to focus on is how do we teach values. So I spend my career working with young public defenders that are going into courtrooms across the country that quite frankly, frankly have lost sight of really important values. In the 50th anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright, right, I, I, I think we have to remember that the Supreme Court told us we can't have equal justice right, if the quality of representation a person has depends on the amount of money that they have and that in order to have equal justice, we need lawyers who are able to ensure that people in the system who don't have money get the same process as people who don't have money. And what our, what our young lawyers, uh, I, I think, find when they go into courtrooms across the South is that these are systems that have lost sight of those values. Right. Every day, and I'm sure it's true in Suffolk County and it's true in most places across the country, you can walk into state courtrooms 
across the country and you can watch poor people being given a level of justice that we would never accept for the people we love. Right? We just simply wouldn't accept it. Uh, but you look around and all of a sudden judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys right, who spend their days in those courtrooms have become okay with it. Right? Somehow they've become numb to the injustice. What I always say to my students is I meet you all. I do the orientation in, 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 in the, for the first year law students. And I meet you and you're so full of passion. Right? And you so much want to change the world. And by the time you get out of law school, some of you have lost that. But when I talk to you three, four, five years down the road, even more of you have lost that. And what happens to a young law student when they enter law, when they enter law school between that time and the time that they are practicing and sort of becoming comfortable with a status quo that really doesn't deliver on equal justice. Right? How does that happen? And so I guess I go back to this question, what can we do as law school professionals? And I think what I certainly try to do as I teach is not just teach skills and not just teach knowledge, um, but I, I try to help my students understand A, the values that are fundamental to the legal system that we aspire to, B, the reality of that legal system uh, and how far we might be from those values. See what the challenges or obstacles are that will make it hard for them to live up to those values. And D, what the strategies are that can help them resist some of those pressures to process. So one thing I do, I, I, I teach a class. Um, I, I direct a program called the Honors Program in Criminal Justice, which is really geared towards students who know they want to go into criminal law either as prosecutors or defense attorneys. And sort of a, a cornerstone of that, of that curriculum is a course where we talk about exactly that. We talk about the ideal. We talk about what our criminal justice system should look like right? in theory. We talk about the role of the defense attorney and the, and, and the role the defense attorney has in promoting justice. We talk about the role of the prosecutor and the role that the prosecutor has in promoting justice. And then we start examining through a video series and through readings uh, just how far we really are from that world. So I have them watch movies like Murder on a Sunday Morning, a documentary Murder on a Sunday Morning. American Violet, while not a documentary, is a wonderful Hollywood movie about a true case out of Hearn, Texas, um, where police raid a housing complex based on the word of an informant, round up 20-some individuals, most of whom, whom end up pleading guilty simply because they just can't afford the bail uh, to get out. It's the only way out. Um, and the heroine of the movie ends up filing suit through the ACLU and exposing the fact that, that, that these cases were built on the word of a of an informant who was both uh, uh, a drug addict and had mental health issues. Um, so I show them movies like that. Um, I show them movies like What Jennifer Saw, which is a great, or, or, or shows like What Jennifer Saw, which is a, a great uh, uh, frontline video about the case of, of Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton, which you all may know, where she falsely accused, uh, although absolutely convinced that she had it right, identified the wrong man for her rape. Um, so I show them videos like that and I have them read books like Amy Bach's Ordinary Injustice, which I recommend to anyone interested in criminal justice. And Amy Bach has a wonderful thesis where she says, ordinary injustice occurs when professionals in the criminal justice system lose sight of their role in perpetuating injustice. I have them read Michelle Alexander's A New Jim Crow. I have them read Paul Butler's book, A Hip Hop Theory of Justice which is a story of a former prosecutor who um, came to question whether he was really able to live up to his obligations to justice. So we have them explore the reality of the criminal justice system um, and ask, how do we close the gap between that reality and the aspirations that we, uh, that, that, that we would love our system to live up to? And then we talk about things like, as a prosecutor, what are some of the challenges you might come across? And as I talk to students today, there were recurring questions, right? Questions like, if I go into an office 
where success is measured by conviction rates. How do I overcome that? How do I resist that and how do I survive? And so we'll talk about, there's a, a wonderful article by a, a law professor named Kenneth Malelli where he talks about this conviction mentality and why it, why it happens. And we talk about why it happens and what prosecutors can do not to change the system tomorrow, but to subtly resist it, work against it, and most importantly, not give in to it. We talk about defense attorneys and the pressures, particularly public defenders, who end up representing about 80% of the people in the criminal justice system. The pressures that they face to process, and no matter how, uh, how idealistic you are going into a public defender office, unless you end up going to one of the very few offices that can afford to do it right, um, you're going to be met with some real pressures to process your clients. Right? One of the most common calls I get from the young lawyers we work with, and I, I, I apologize, you'll hear this again tonight, but, but I, I, it is a call from a young lawyer saying, you know, I think I need to quit because I feel defeated. I've come to Gideon's promise. I've learned what every client deserves. I know, in theory, what I need to do to represent my clients well. But I have 200 cases. I can't do it. I feel defeated. I'm getting discouraged by the number of people I watch fall through the cracks. And I always say to them, you know, the challenge is how do you focus on what you can improve and not get defeated by what is beyond your control? And so these lawyers go into offices where they're going to watch 50 people fall through the cracks this year while they struggle to save another 50. Right? And maybe they really only can give 10 the kind of representation they really feel they deserve. And that can be defeating. But on the other hand, if they understand that by giving 10 the representation they deserve, they're saving 10 people who otherwise would have a lawyer who had given in to ordinary injustice, who had come to accept the status quo, that can be a meaningful accomplishment. Right? And if they can resist getting defeated by the 50 who have fallen through the cracks, right, they can survive. Um, and so I think we spend a lot of time with our lawyers talking about that and I try to get my students to really think about what it's going to be like to be a legal professional in that environment. Uh, and I think it is incredibly challenging. And I'll tell you, I think if we're not doing it in law school, if we are not preparing our students to go into dysfunctional systems and giving them strategies to survive, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to leave the systems, or they're going to give in to the status quo. There, uh, I, I think, sort of an example of each of those. There's a young lawyer named Marie. When I first left, and I started my career at the DC Public Defender Service, which is one of those public defender offices that fortunately can give clients what they deserve. I didn't realize how rare it was until 10 years later I left when I got a call um, and was asked to become the training director for a new statewide public defender system in Georgia. And I went down to Georgia sort of thinking, oh, we're going to bring some PDS lawyering to Georgia. And man, was I wrong, right? Couldn't have been further from the truth. And, uh, I, I, and when, we, when I went down to Georgia, um, I remember the first training that we did. It was a training on basic motions practice. Right, fourth, Fifth, Sixth Amendment motions. And we did this training, and it was for all of these new public defenders. Some were brand new, some were chief public defenders. There were about 49 chief public defenders who were literally just handed the mantle to usher in reform in Georgia. And we did this training on motions practice. It was nothing complex. How do you write the motion? Right? How do you litigate it? What are the goals? Afterwards, one of the new chief public defenders came up to me and he said, you know, that was really, uh, that was wonderful. I really like that training, but you know, we, we can't do that where I practice. And I said, what do you mean you can't do it? You can do it. He said, no, no, we can't do that where I practice. I said, no, sure you can. No, that, that was federal constitutional law. It applies here in Georgia, I assure you. He said, no, no, we, we can't do that where I practice. You see, if we file motions, the judges get mad at us. Right? And that was my introduction to really a very different 
culture. Right? That was really my introduction to a different way of, uh, 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 of practicing. It really awakened me to a reality that I didn't understand, certainly not coming out of law school and not even after spending 10 years in an office that works. You know, I went to New Orleans. And I was in New Orleans, and within a week of being in New Orleans, I was asked to, um, to visit night court, night arraignments. I walked into night arraignments. And there were about 40 men in orange jumpsuits waiting to be arraigned that night, first appearance hearings. They were going to be arraigned if they were misdemeanors or, or presented if it was a felony. And, uh, and the judge took the bench around 6.30. And there were two public defenders there. And there was one private lawyer. And the private lawyer had one case on the calendar. And the public defender had the other, say, 39. And the judge got on the bench around 6.30, called the first case. Whose case do you think was called first? private counsels. Spent about 10 minutes or so going back and forth with private counsel before finally giving private counsel what it is that private counsel asked for, a nominal bond. The private counsel said, thank you, left. The judge then turned to these two public defenders and said, okay, you better talk quickly because we're going to be out of here by 7. It was 20 to 7. Right? Just a different kind of justice for poor people. And I think that we just, we have an obligation as law school professors to make sure that our students know that. Um, they know that reality. Uh, because I know working with young folks, they're under a real misconception about what the legal system looks like. So I think we have to think about how we, about how we uh, teach that to our students. I think those are challenges defenders run into. I think for prosecutors, uh, I think there's a real question given your obligation as a minister of justice, what is your role when you see defense counsel completely unprepared, ill-equipped, or under-resourced, right, and they're given into processing people? Is it to take advantage of that? Or is it to not participate? And what does that look like? How do you do that in such a way that you don't quit, because it doesn't help us to have you quit, but you can think strategically about how you push the system forward. Uh, through Gideon's Promise, we started Gideon's Promise in 2007 after I saw um, this, kind of, uh, this kind of culture across Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Uh, Gideon's Promise was started really as an effort to just groom a generation of public defenders to resist this kind of practice. And it started, and I'll admit naively, as a, as a program that was going to take these young lawyers, and it was subversive, right? We'd send them into these broken systems, and they would go fight back against the systems and change things. And I, I even underestimated how difficult it would be for them. And so, uh, and then three years later, and Gideon's Promise is this, it's the, the core program is a three-year program where our lawyers come to us as a class, and they spend 14 days together in Birmingham at a boot camp learning values, learning skills, learning, learning uh, uh, strategies. And they leave after 14 days and go back to their offices. Now there are over 35 offices we work with. And they're given mentors. We have a, a faculty of about 70 public defenders from around the country who mentor these young people and who train them. They're given mentors and they're connected by a, a, an online um, uh, Google Groups, right? Something a young person in my office came up with. And they're able to, to communicate through a distribution list and share resources and victories and challenges. And then they come back together every six months for additional training, mentorship, um, community building. And that goes on for three years. Well, our first group graduated in 2010. And then the question became, what happens to them now? Because if they go back to these systems without any help, aren't they going to backslide? So we were able to get funding to start a graduate program, where what we do is uh, we allow every graduate to sign up for three more years, where they can learn to be trainers and mentors and support the newer lawyers. We then developed a leadership program where chief public defenders from our partner offices meet every six months to talk about how they can support these lawyers in becoming the lawyers they want to be, to get management and leadership training right, to help transform their office into the kinds of offices that work better for clients. We started, and this is what's really relevant, I think, to the, the law school community, we then started a trainer development program 
And initially, it was really just to teach our trainers our curriculum. But what we quickly realized was, uh, was if we really wanted to be effective, we had to partner with law schools. And so we started inviting law school clinicians to our trainer development conference. And when we did that, what I was really thinking of was my own clinical experience. I was in a law school clinic, and I went to George Washington. And I, I was in a program called DC Law Students in Court. And I remember through DC Law Students in Court, I had the great experience of handling three cases and learning to do them really, really well. Right? And I was absolutely prepared to go to the DC Public Defender Service and probably no other public defender office in the country. Right? Because I knew how to handle a case really, really well. What I didn't know how to do was how to operate in a world that wouldn't let me handle every case really, really well. Had I gone to Georgia, Mississippi, or Louisiana out of that experience, I would have been paralyzed. I would have been paralyzed. And so we started inviting clinicians to the uh, trainer development program. And the goal was really to first teach clinicians how we are training lawyers to be client-centered lawyers under really challenging conditions to talk to them about how they might take some of that and bring it back to their clinical teaching so they can work with <coughs> students who maybe will end up in imperfect situations, but still think about how they could be client-centered in those environments. But also, most importantly, to try to get clinicians to think about how they can inspire their best clinical students to not only think about going to the closest public defender office, the one across the street, the best public defender office, whatever that may be, but to really help them think about a career going to systems that need them the most, inspiring them to do it, and helping them connect with folks that can make that possible. And so our trainer development conference actually now has a track for clinicians where we partner with clinicians to think about how we can really, I think, pull law schools into this movement to get law schools thinking about how they can help us fuel this movement of lawyers doing this work in the most difficult places. And then the fifth program we have is a law clerk program where we work with law students and, uh, and offer them a summer working with one of our lawyers in Jackson, Mississippi or Lafayette, Louisiana or Valdosta, Georgia, uh, really understanding what it's like to do this work in challenging environments. Uh, and some of those students come down and they say, man, that's great, I'm not doing this. And others come down and say, this is the career for me. But if it weren't for the law clerk program, they wouldn't even know that was an option. So I, I want to sort of, I think, finish with probably how I respond to the most common question I get from law students. And then I want to take questions because I'm not sure that I've really covered the things that, that, that are most interesting to you. But the most common question I get from law students is this. Students will say, you know, if I get a chance to go to PDS, um, and a lot of law students come to me because my PDS connections are now in different law schools, so they send them to me. And they say, if I get a chance to go to PDS, or I could come join Gideon's Promise and work in Mississippi or Tennessee or Alabama, which should I do? And I always say that's not an easy answer. There's not one right answer. I think the question really is what kind of lawyer do you want to be? If you want to be the best lawyer you could possibly be, go to PDS. You will go there, they'll give you six weeks of training before you even have a client. You'll be surrounded by some of the best public defenders in the country. And they'll mentor you. And they'll be there every time you have a question. You'll have a caseload that'll let you do everything you want to do. You will develop into a wonderful public defender. But the fact is, you will not do a thing to improve the quality of justice for poor people in Washington, DC. You'll help maintain a very high standard. But if you're not there, there are 100 people just as good as you waiting to get in the door, and they'll do just as good of a job. If you go to Mississippi or Louisiana or Georgia, you're not going to get the kind of attention they'll give you at PDS. You will learn to take some shortcuts. You won't learn to be the best lawyer 
possible. You might learn it on the front end through Gideon's promise, but you won't be able to continue to perfect your craft. Right? But what you will do is you will save people who otherwise would fall through the cracks. What you will do is you'll be part of a movement that is really working collectively to realize a better world. And what you will do is you will make life better for some poor people who otherwise wouldn't have an advocate. And so just as in the 1960s there was really important work being done in Philadelphia and New York and Washington DC, right, the front lines were where the system was most broken. Right? And it was across the South. And I think that's true today. I say to my students, you can have a wonderful career and be an amazing public defender in Philadelphia, and New York, and Washington, D.C. What I say is the front lines, though, right? if we're going to really improve indigent defense in this country, join us in the South. Now, I have to say there's a caveat, because I'm, I'm well aware of Harrell Herring, and I know about the state of indigent defense in New York. And I actually, I think when I say the front lines is Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, um, I think that really is just sort of uh, uh, symbolic of a front line that really, it's not a line at all. It's a zigzag all across this country. And while there are public defender offices in New York that are among the best, there are public defender offices in New York that are among the worst. Um, the, the challenge, I think, for me, as if someone said to me, why don't I go to a really broken system in New York and help fix it? The challenge for me is, at this point, I can't give you the support of Gideon's promise because we're not there yet. But the need is great. And it may be that right here in Suffolk County, they're getting that support from this law school, from the community that you all have built. But I think at the end of the day, these are conversations, if we're not having these conversations with our students, and if we are training them to understand what the system could look like and then sending them off into it to be shocked, I think we're doing them a disservice. Um, again, I think that everything I know about Turo, this is a really impressive group of folks who have a real commitment and are thinking about this at a much deeper level than most law schools. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to be here with you. I look forward to answering your, your questions, but it's been an inspirational half a day for me already, and I'm looking forward to the rest. All right. We have time for questions. Tom? It seems to me obvious that uh, in the wake of Gideon, the failure was on a societal, institutional level you know, was there ever a push, say, by Democrats, liberals, to you know, provide the resources and structures to implement the case <laughs> over, all over, uh, on a, you know, a, over, I mean, nationwide basis, rather than uh, you know, um, delegating it to county uh, bars and that sort of thing? Uh, you know, at a national level, I, I'm not aware of one. And I, I do actually, uh, there's a group of uh, of us who have been having regular meetings with the new head of the Office of Justice Programs at DOJ and, and uh, the Assistant Attorney General Tony West. And I know that, I, I do believe this is a Department of Justice that is more concerned about the issue than others. But, you know, things are falling apart in the federal system. And quite frankly, in, in these economic times, I don't think there is a federal, I don't think there will be a federal movement to solve Gideon as a problem. On the state, but, but I do think that, that Progressives in the White House has been slightly better for us than, uh, than the older days, right? Or, or at least the days before Obama. But I do think at, at the state levels, so in Georgia, for example, there was a lot of promise. The reform, the, Georgia, the systemic reform in Georgia was pushed through by a Democratic legislature. The problem is within two years, that legislature became Republican. There was much less commitment to indigent defense, and, and, and the, the state has been chipping away at that public defender system ever since. But I couldn't make a blanket statement because I just think every state is so different and how they fund indigent defense is so different, and whether there's a state commitment versus a burden put on each county varies from state to state. In New York, as I understand it, you're at the mercy of your local county government upstate, and you know, some of them have very meager resources uh, for public well, but even in Georgia, so the way the Georgia system works, and I'm sure this is true in many states, 
the state makes a commitment to fund, to contribute to indigent defense in each county. The counties then can supplement it as they decide to. So wealthier counties like Fulton and DeKalb, where Atlanta, right, where Atlanta is, they have better public defender systems. Most of those lawyers are county-funded lawyers. You go down to Waycross, Georgia, southern Georgia, and there are no county-funded positions. They're, they just have to make do with whatever the state gives them. And you have a very unequal distribution of indigent defense services just based on what counties are willing to contribute. Um, so I, I what, what advice do you give students who are um, committed to doing um, criminal defense work but can't get a job, um, at least in New York? So I suspect part of the answer may be come on down. But, uh, but short of that, what advice in terms of career paths for students who really want to do that work but, um, but there aren't enough jobs for them now? I wish I could say, come on down. I don't have a pocket full of jobs to give out. That's, I wish I did. I, I wish I did. But we try to be very creative in creating opportunities. I, I think that um, the, the problem is there, there are a substantial number of students who feel like they are limited geographically. right? And there's not much to say to them other than be a pest, keep knocking on doors, wait for openings to come along. And I tend to think that probably another answer is, have this conversation in your first year because frequently, and I'm sure it's true in New York, when offices start hiring, they like to hire known quantities. So if you've been around for two years as, a, as an intern or an extern, you probably increase your chances. But for those students who really are, are more willing to go where the need is great, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to make that happen. I'll share with you a, an initiative that actually we have just launched called the Law School Partnership Project. So one of the greatest challenges we've had for the last seven years is we have very successfully gotten law students around the country to start thinking about coming to the South through Gideon's Promise. Students who never, I, that was never on my radar as a, as a law student. Um, we have very successfully gotten our partner offices to appreciate the quality of folks coming out of these law schools that we're recruiting. And they, wa they, they want these students. The problem is the offices we work with if they have an opening in March, they can't hold it open till October or September. The caseloads are too great. Our students need to know by February, March, where they're going to be working because they have to register to take a bar, right? unless they know they're going to be in New York or, or something like that. And so that's always been our challenge. So we started an initiative called the Law School Partnership Project. And what it is is this. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that we just got a Department of Justice grant to help with this. Um, but the initiative is this. For if law schools are able to support a graduate for up to one year, and I know some law schools are in a better position to do this than others. There are some law schools that have fellowship programs already. But if they can support a graduate for up to one year, we will put them in a partner office that will promise within that year to move them into a permanent position. So in other words, these are offices that have enough turnover that they know within a year they'll get a position. So law school might end up supporting the student for 11 months. It might be six months. It might be four months. But the law school commits to supporting them for up to a year. The office will move them into a permanent position within that year. And then the Department of Justice is going to fund their participation in Gideon's Promise for three years. So they will get the training, the support, the community they need. We are only putting them in offices with chief public defenders who share our vision and our commitment. Not that they're not challenging, but, but they're going to have support. And, and I believe through, this is sort of a, the second big federal initiative we had. Two years ago, we had something called the Public Defender Corps, where we partnered with Equal Justice Works and had some fellowships to get folks down to southern offices. But we are continually to think creatively about how we can get your students opportunities in places where they didn't exist before. And so to the extent that, uh, again, I'm not sure what Toro's situation is, but to the extent that there are any opportunities for us to partner, to think creatively about how to get some, to inspire your graduates to join us and then help get them to our partner offices, we're all ears. I have two questions. Um, first, uh, you've told us about your experience and, and it's a very uh, moving story that you've told. Um, yeah, you, you haven't said anything about the racial dimensions of, the, of your experience down uh, in uh, the South. Can you do that? Yeah. 
So uh, I think the racial dimensions in the South are probably no different than the racial dimensions elsewhere. I, uh, I should say it's no secret, but actually it probably isn't as well known as it needs to be. Right? The criminal justice system is overwhelmingly a system for poor people. 80% of the people in the criminal justice system are poor. Also, um, extremely disproportionately a system for people of color. If you are, are African-American, you are six times more likely to end up in the criminal justice system than a similarly situated white person. So, and, and certainly that is true in the South as well. Uh, what I experienced in the South that I didn't experience in Washington, D.C., though, is that there really are very poor white communities in the South where the system is almost all poor white people. Uh, a number, I, I met a number of your students last night watching this movie Gideon's Army and one of the lawyers that they follow is a lawyer in Hall County, Georgia and the client they follow is a white client and that's not just coincidental. Most of his clients are white clients. So I'm not trying to minimize the racial dimension because I do think this is a civil rights issue and race has a lot to do with that. But, but when I first came down to Georgia, one of the most interesting stories was a young woman named Janelle. Janelle grew up in Brooklyn in an all-black community. She went to Spelman College. She went to Howard Law School. She became a public defender because she wanted to represent people who looked like her. She joined the honors program and got placed in Barrow and Gordon counties in Georgia about 45 minutes outside of Atlanta, but couldn't be further away from Atlanta. Right? All of her clients were white. In fact, she was the only African-American female lawyer in the courthouse. And she would tell stories about how she would come to court. And she'd walk into court with her briefcase and her jacket. And the, and the, the, um, the deputies would say, ma'am, where's your lawyer? Right? And it took her a while to even become known as a lawyer in the community. And then she tells this brilliant story, which to me is the power of youth and why youth is so important to, the move, to, to, the, to, to building movements. She tells this story about how she had a case. She was representing a juvenile. And the law said that the juvenile cannot be detained unless there are no um, less restrictive alternatives available that will accomplish the same end. And she said, this is sentencing, and I've got less restrictive alternatives to incarceration. And I want to open up the statute book and argue the statute. And she started talking to senior lawyers in the community who said, what a, that's a waste of time. That's not how we do things here. Right? No one's going to listen to you. And she called me up and said, what do I do? And I said, open up the statute book. And she went into court, and she opens the statute book and begins to argue the statute. And behind her, she hears snickers of the other senior lawyers in the courtroom. And then the judge agrees with her and doesn't lock up her client. And now, to this day, she'll tell you that some of those snickerers are making the same arguments. Right? So that wasn't your question, but it was just a great opportunity to share a great story. Um, but, but I, but, but, yeah, but, but, but I, 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 the, the racial dimensions are the same in the South, and they're. They're, they're obviously incredibly problematic. The second question, if I may, uh, and, and this will just take a moment on your part. You, know, you, you are at the end of a very long line of people who have come here talking about the inequality in the justice system, which is not to diminish uh, the importance of your visit here today or to show any disrespect. Do, we, do you have a number in your head uh, of what it would take, dollars that it would take, to more or less equalize the situation. If we had a dollar number, then maybe we could process it and see if we could fit it into the budget and uh, maybe decide to spend it on equal justice rather than something else. Some number would be helpful. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think such a number exists for a couple of reasons, right? One, I, I think it's, it really does vary so much from state to state and from county to county. You have places like Alabama and, and Mississippi where there are a couple of full-time public defender offices and otherwise they're court-appointed lawyers or even worse low bid contracts where the person who bids the lowest to handle the most cases gets the contract right really hard to put a dollar figure on how to how to correct that what I do think is this I, I think funding is obviously a big issue but I think as reformers um, if we focus on funding to the exclusion of other problems, we aren't going to solve the problem. So when I, 
when I first really started thinking about indigent defense reform, uh, everything I read and everyone I talked to talked about the problems in two categories. The first was funding. We need more money, and we absolutely need more money. The second was structure. Right? We have to have structures that give public defenders independence. If public defenders depend on their cases by pleasing a judge, because judges appoint them, they're going to be more beholden to the judge than to the client. If they're part-time public defenders and they can take private cases, they're going to spend more time on their private cases trying to attract more money than the cases that they're getting the paid, paid the same amount for regardless of what they do. And so everyone talks about structure and funding. I think what we're trying to say is there's a third problem that we have to deal with, and that is culture. Because if we do not change a culture that accepts this processing, even funding and structural fixes won't solve the problem. So I, I know chief public defenders who, if you gave them more money and more independence, they would say, great, I can leave today at 1 instead of at 4. I'll drive a nicer car. Right? And so that the culture is a big piece. I, I'm really sorry. I want to share one more story with you. But there is a, 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 a friend of mine who, who's a, a leader of the, uh, of the public defender system in Tennessee sent me a video of the president of the Tennessee Public Defender Conference. This is the, the, the group of public, chief public defenders in Tennessee, and they elect the president. This is the president that they elected. He's at a budget hearing. And the question put to him is this, do you have enough resources? And his response is, well, let me tell you, I have a five county district. So I have five courthouses. And I have five public defenders, one in each courthouse. I used to have four, but I took one of my two investigator positions and made it a lawyer position. So I have five public defenders in five courthouses. Last year, we closed 4,000 cases. That's 800 cases per lawyer. He then said, so you can feel good there, there's at least one district in Tennessee that has enough. I'm blessed. Right? I don't care how much money you give him or how much you change the structure. If we don't change a mindset that thinks processing 800 people per lawyer, if we don't, is OK, I don't think we're going to have meaningful reform. So again, I don't mean to dodge your question. I, I dodge it because I really don't know the answer. But I also dodge it because I, I really, my mission is to get all of us thinking, not to abandon the financial argument, because it's probably the most important, but to also think beyond it. Um, so sorry, I'm 0 for 2 with you. You got it. Mary Ann is upset. Um, I'm interested in what you do in teaching law students um, uh, who want to be prosecutors and what you do or what you can do or what others can do to kind of inoculate them against or try to inoculate them against um, this overwhelming prosecutorial culture, I think, that, that really eventually, I, I think, um, has very little regard for the defendant. We spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time with my students talking to them about the role of the prosecutor as minister of justice and what that means. I talk to them a lot about justice being a system where people who are probably guilty, likely guilty, almost certainly guilty, right? It's a system designed for those people to be acquitted and that there is a benefit to having a system like that. It protects all of us. And so I, I try to help them understand that, that justice isn't convictions. It is supporting a system that sometimes will mean people who are factually guilty go free. And I try to help them understand their obligation to justice and the consequences, the cost of not living up to it. So through readings, through videos, through guest speakers, I bring in a lot of speakers who are formerly incarcerated some of whom were wrongfully convicted, some of whom like Reverend uh, Billy, Billy Neal Moore, who was actually uh, convicted of, of a murder he, and sentenced to die for a murder he admittedly did. But you now meet him, and you see that he's not a life that you would want to extinguish. And so I try to help them see the real consequences to an attitude that forgets about justice, and talk to them about how they can try to resist some of the pressures to abandon that. But I have to be honest with you. I, I don't have enough faith in my own 
teaching ability or brainwashing ability to think that lasts much longer than the time they're in my class. And so I, I really do think that if we're going, that the kind of program we've developed for public defenders through Gideon's Promise, we need that for prosecutors. There should be a place where prosecutors go to be reminded of the values that the system forgot and give them strategies to live up to it. And when they run into those challenges in court that day, they have a community they can Google group with or call and get someone saying, don't give in, reminding them why they're doing it. So I think it starts in law school, but I think it's got to go beyond law school. Do you think, though, if there was a Gideon's program for prosecutors, that those prosecutors might have trouble getting hired? Well, I, I, no, so I think, I, I mean, I think you would have to, to do a program like that and to be successful just as with our defenders. You'd have to identify offices where the head public defender embraces your vision. That might be hard to do. There, there's a prosecutor in, in Dallas, Craig Watkins, who, uh, who I know. And I don't know if I'd say Craig and I necessarily see eye to eye perfectly on this. But he's very receptive to this idea. And he actually, when we talked, he said, I think we really should talk about having a program for prosecutors. He might be someone who supports that. You know, he has bucked other prosecutors and, and gone out looking for evidence of wrongful convictions and, and, and initiated proceedings to overturn convictions. So, but I think you'd have to find the prosecutors who, who are on board with it. I just want to say, I just want to respond to Sarah's question because we had a student who interviewed two days ago with the Queen's DA office and the student was given a series of hypos. After the student answered those hypos, the two people who were interviewing her basically said, you should be a legal aid lawyer when I'm interested in hiring. <coughs> um, so I think those who do indicate a kind of sensitivity like you're talking about, I think in most of the offices around New York sort of won't get hired because that's not who they're looking yeah. for. That's true in Georgia. And I, I have a lot of students. I'll say to them, you should go in there and say to them, this is the kind of prosecutor I want to be. And if they won't hire you, that's not a place you want to work because you'll turn around tomorrow and find that you're a person, not only a lawyer, a person that you don't respect. So I do think you have to, and I think that's true with public defenders as well. I think our students have to go in and say, this is what I'm hoping to accomplish. I understand there are challenges that might keep me from getting there, but do you at least support me in my effort to get there? Yeah, and I think if the answer is no, that's probably not a job they should take. A lot of unemployed prosecutors then, right? <laughs> we have time for one more question. Eileen? Oh, so how does that, your answer to that last question square with your general advice, which is that you should go, public attorneys who want to be public defenders should go to the more challenging um, areas? Because it seems to me that, I mean, I'm hearing something inconsistent, that, that the, the student who interviews at the prosecutor's office and, and speaks truthfully about his or her values, you would say, don't go there. That's not the right environment for you. But you're sending would-be public defenders with you know, good values into kind of hostile environments or bad mm -hmm. systems also. Yeah, no, I, so I certainly need to clarify that. That's not, no, what I mean is this. We send public defenders into broken systems with leadership that agrees the systems are broken and then embrace the values that we embrace. If a young public defender went to one of the chiefs we work with and said, this is the kind of lawyer I want to be, the chief would say, great, that's the kind of lawyer I want. Now let me tell you, you're not going to be that lawyer tomorrow. And I need to help you get closer to it, but you're not going to get there tomorrow. And, and, and those are the kinds of partner offices we choose, and that's where we send lawyers. I think as a young prosecutor, if you go to a prosecutor's office and say, this is the kind of prosecutor I want to be, and the prosecutor said, I agree, I want you to get there, but these are the reasons why systemically it won't happen tomorrow, I would encourage a prosecutor to go there. It's the, it's the chief who says, we don't want you if those are your values, right? that would cause me to say, don't go to that office. And I feel that way about a public defender office as well. If you asked me seven years ago, I would have said, so I would have said go to that public defender's office anyway and very subversively overthrow that way of thinking. I now recognize the naivety of my ways. <laughs> I, I remind you uh, that if you're hungry for more, 6.30 tonight in the uh, auditorium, I hope.
Um, John will be speaking then. Thank you all very much. Thank you.